over the past few weeks as I've had opportunity to interact with uh, our church members via WhatsApp and telephone calls and even in my surgery, I've been greatly encouraged to hear the repeated refrain that although times are tough for all of us, we are trusting God. In spite of what we see, we are trusting God. And it's in times of trial and difficulty, such as the days that we face at the moment, that we actually need to exercise real faith. We're forced to exercise real faith. Times of trial can be a little bit like going to the optometrist for a new set of glasses. As you put on that, that perfect prescription, the world seems to become a lot crisper and clearer. When in fact, it's not that the world has become any clearer. It's just your perception of it, which is far better able to see the world for what it really is. And the truth is that we are no less dependent on God during times of ease and prosperity, but we're so much more aware of having to trust him in times of hardship and trial. We feel our own weakness far more keenly, and we're aware more acutely of our own lack of control over events. We're certainly more aware of our own lostness, our own impotence, our own lack of certainty regarding the future. There's so much unknown. There's so many what-if questions. What if this continues for another six months? What if I'm not able to open my business at level three? What if this virus mutates and those who had immunity are no longer protected? What if my husband or my wife gets sick and I'm left with the children on my own? No muscle builds itself. We know this. No matter how much you desire Batman's pecs and abs, you're not going to get them without a lot of hard work and some self-imposed suffering. Probably a lot of it. And if you're a, a scrawny, a skinny guy, you may even find yourself in a moment of weakness praying that God would help you to get these, these gains that you're looking for. But the fact remains that no amount of prayer, no amount of sitting around and desiring it is going to make you look like Batman. Without pumping those irons and putting in the, the suffering and the hard work, uh, nothing is going to change. Now, we know very well that God works through means. And this is just one example. Your muscles don't grow unless you actually exercise them. So we know that God uses ordinary things. He uses events and things and people and circumstances to accomplish his will in this world. Of course, God could have done it another way, but he hasn't. He's chosen to work through means. And the same thing is true when we talk about growing in our ability to trust God. Trusting God is not something that happens overnight, and no amount of desire is going to cause it to come about. It's something which is learnt. There's no such thing as, a, as an anti-anxiety vaccine, which is suddenly going to boost our trust immunity. So in times of hardship and trial, as a mature believer, we really ought to be thanking God for the opportunity to grow in our ability to trust him. We really ought to be thanking him for the opportunity to grow in our faith. Now, I think it's accurate for me to say that all true believers long to be able to trust God more completely. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. We hear the martyr Stephen crying from the ground as the rocks fall upon him uh, from the, the apostate Jews who were stoning him for what, they had, what he had said about their crucifixion of the Messiah. We wish that we could show the same sort of faith, the same sort of confidence in God in spite of what we see happening around us. But I think that despite our wishes, we most often can identify far more readily with the father of the boy who uh, was demon-possessed, who said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. So it is my hope that together we will be challenged to grow in our ability to trust God as we again consider and flesh out another proverb tonight. Now, you may have noticed, uh, starting last week, that we've changed gears a little bit. Originally, uh, up until chapter 9, we've been working our way systematically through the various texts in Proverbs uh, and expounding on them. And now, from chapter 9 onwards, we're going to be looking more thematically at Proverbs and taking various themes and seeing what the book of Proverbs teaches us about those themes. And so, as you may have already gathered, this evening we're going to be looking at this theme of trusting in God. Now, of course, there's many passages that Proverbs uh, uses to address this topic. One of the most famous being the, the passage in chapter 3, which speaks about trusting in the Lord and not leaning on your understanding. Um, but Doug did address that about two years ago. And so if you're interested in that, then you can look back in the archives on the website. But tonight we're going to have a look at Proverbs chapter 28, 
and verse 26. That's Proverbs 28, verse 26, which reads, Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. Now, I've broken down that verse into three basic components for tonight's devotion. The first is a treacherous mind, then a trustworthy word, and finally, the deliverance, which means that at the end, it'll all be okay. So firstly, a treacherous mind. As we begin, let's notice right at the outset that whoever trusts in his own mind is said to be a fool. Now, over the past few weeks, as we've looked at the book of Proverbs, we've heard much about lady folly and lady wisdom. And we understand by now that folly always leads to destruction. A few weeks ago, Tommy helpfully showed us that folly makes many promises on the outset, but all of them turn up empty. Folly is not able to deliver on her boasting. And so, it should be no surprise to us that the wisdom of the world would tell us, the wisdom of the world being equivalent to folly, would tell us that when we're faced with a trial, we need to make a plan. We need to believe in ourselves and the power of our brains to solve our own problems. Other versions of the English Bible, apart from the, the ESV that we're using tonight, translate the word for mind that we see here in the ESV. They translate that as heart. And I think that that alternative is actually very helpful because we all know that trust is not simply a, a mind activity. Trust involves both the mind and the heart. We don't simply take a set of facts on the one hand and then a set of facts on the other hand, stack them up and see which pile is bigger and then trust that. No, trust is far more complex. Trust involves both the mind and the heart. But ideally, we need our hearts to be informed by our minds. We need to grasp and understand truth and allow that to affect the way that we feel. But most of the time, in our fallen state, we allow our minds to be the slaves of our hearts. Most of the time, we feel a cold sense of panic, a sense of dread, a, a panic attack, for lack of a better word. Uh, we, we feel that, and then we begin to think in line with what our hearts are feeling. The worry and the anxiety that we feel tells our minds that we need to do something. We need to fix this mess. We need to escape. We need to make a plan. But the writer of Proverbs here, speaking of heavenly wisdom, says that the one who trusts in his heart or his own mind is a fool. Seeing is believing, right? Seeing is believing. But let me suggest to you from this proverb that that's actually a kind of arrogance. We are presuming that all that we can see, whether it be with our physical eyes or with our mind's eye, must be true. We can see how this whole thing is going to pan out. We're very good at the sort of modeling that we see a lot of going on around us nowadays. Basically, the recipe is you take a couple of limited facts and then you trace a trajectory based on those facts all the way through until you ultimately reach a situation where you need to call on all hands to man the panic stations because the sky is going to fall. Some examples might be my, my child suffers from allergies. And so they're going to contract the virus and then they're going to get sick and they're going to land up in ICU needing a ventilator and there's not going to be any ventilators and they're going to finally meet their end. Or I'm never going to leave my house again. I'm never going to see my grandchildren again. Or we're going to lose our jobs and then that'll lead to us losing our house and then we're going to lead, lose our cars and ultimately we're going to have no food or shelter and live out on the streets like beggars. You know these sort of narratives. I'm sure that many of them have come through your own mind over the past few weeks. Now, I'm always greatly encouraged and also hugely convicted whenever I read that story of Elisha and the armies of Syria. Elisha was able, by God's power, to inform the king of Israel what the plans, the hostile plans of the king of Syria were, were going to be. And so the king of Syria planned to attack Israel at such and such a place, and Elisha would know that beforehand and then would go to the king of Israel and inform him so that he could avoid that place and thwart the, the plans of the king of Syria. And so the king of Syria naturally assumes that there must be a spy in his ranks. And so he calls his servants together and he demands to know who it is who's snitching to the king of Israel. But his servants tell him that no one's being treacherous. 
In fact, the answer is really far more mysterious because there's a prophet in Israel, a prophet called Elisha, who knows the every move of the king of Syria and reports it to the king of Israel so that the king of Israel can escape. And so the king of Syria decides that he needs to change objectives temporarily. First, he needs to leave aside going after the king of Israel and first take out this prophet Elisha so that he can retain this element of surprise that he needs when he attacks the armies of Israel. So the king of Syria sends his armies to Dothan. And 2 Kings 6 tells us, So he sent their horses and chariots and a great army, and they came by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant, that is the servant of Elisha, said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Can you hear the panic in this fool's voice? He's trusting his own mind. He's listening to his own heart. Elisha says to him, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with, with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O oh Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. The truth is, brothers and sisters, the things that we can see and conceive of are not all there is. For us to trust ourselves, our own hearts and minds completely, is both foolish and arrogant. Our hearts and our minds are not ultimately trustworthy. In fact, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, Jeremiah tells us. And so our hearts are not only ignorant, but they are also treacherous. And the man who trusts in his own mind is a fool. Worldly wisdom would dictate that what we can see and smell and touch and hear and taste are the most real things that there are. And yet Elisha's servant could not see the Lord's army encamped around the city. If he could have seen that army and yet was still so panic-stricken, we would think him a great fool. Um, we, would, we would think of him as being irrationally anxious if he could see all that there was. And yet he couldn't. He couldn't see it and he trusted in his own mind anyway and was proven to be a fool. Now, nowhere are we promised in Scripture that we will always be delivered miraculously like Elisha and his servant were. But the fact is, and my point at this point is, is simply this, there is far more to reality than what we can see and conceive of. To ignore this, this fact, is to be foolish. To ignore the fact that God, the great mover, is working behind the scenes, working out his plan in this world, to ignore that fact is foolish. And so we come to the trustworthy word. Proverbs 28, 26 goes on, showing us that while we should not trust in our own mind, what we should trust is the way of wisdom. Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. Now, I'm fairly sure that, as is often done on these live streams, if I were to run a poll on what is wisdom, we would probably get at least 10 different answers. Now, we've seen that reality consists of far more than just our five senses can detect. But simply knowing that, simply understanding that truth, leaves us no better off than we really were before. We need to know what else is real. What else is there which can not only stack the facts in our favor, but convince our fluttering hearts to rest easy again? But thankfully, Proverbs 28, 26 helps us to answer that question as well. Sorry, the whole book of Proverbs helps us to answer that question as well. We see in Proverbs 2, verse 6, For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Proverbs 9 verse 10. The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. Proverbs 3 19. And so I would put it to you that the word of the Lord is what is said to be wisdom. And we know from John 1 that the word of the Lord is God the Son incarnate himself. And so if we want to walk in wisdom, we need to know the word of the Lord. Now, once, a, once again, this knowing is more than a familiarity with the truth, but it's certainly not less than that. We need to be familiar with the inspired word of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, 
all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Brothers and sisters, do you really believe that? Do you really believe that scripture is sufficient for all of life and godliness? Sometimes I think we can wish that scripture was written a little bit uh, more to our liking, a little bit more perhaps like a, a textbook or like a systematic theology, something which would be easy to reference. You would be able to look up a question in the, in the index and go and find the answer. And we find that scripture is not like that. But we know that the Bible is perfect the way that it is. The way that the Bible is written can be translated into hundreds of different languages. It remains relevant and understandable across vast expanses of time through different cultures and circumstances. And as a result of this incredible breadth of influence, along with the fact that spiritual things are spiritually discerned, we understand that getting to know the scriptures, getting to understand and be familiar with the scriptures is going to take some sanctified hard work. Now, this work might mean making a reading plan. It might mean waking up a little earlier, having the self-discipline to not snooze that alarm and get out of bed to read the Bible. But don't allow yourself to see this as optional. It's not optional. This is essential. We must know the word of the Lord. Trusting God can and must start with Scripture. Unless you're absolutely convinced of the value and the sufficiency of Scripture, you will continue to flounder in uncertainty and anxiety all your life long. The sufficiency of Scripture is the bedrock of all other confidence that we can have. If the Bible cannot be trusted, if the Bible cannot be understood, if the Bible is not completely without error or fault, then the foundation of our confidence simply crumbles. If we need some other knowledge, something outside the Bible, in order for us to have confidence and trust God, if we need something outside of scriptures for our life and godliness, then we can have no confidence. If you want to be con confident, if you want to trust God in these uncertain days, if you want to experience what true and mature faith is, you must believe 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that all scripture is profitable. You must believe it enough to do something about it. But having been convinced of the value and the trustworthiness of this book, the Bible, you must learn to grow familiar with it. You need to know its contents. You need to, you need to be familiar with it such that you're able to recite it and call it to mind. Not perhaps verbatim, but you need to know it. There's a man in our congregation who I spoke to probably over 10 years ago, who at the time told me that he had read through the Bible in its entirety over 40 times. That's not something that happens overnight. That's something that happens due to planning and discipline. And we need more of that sort of familiarity. We need to know the scriptures and be able to bring to mind truths such as Hebrews 13, 5, which says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Or John 16, 33, in this world, you will have tribulation. Take heart, I have overcome the world. Psalm 37, 25, I have been young and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. Proverbs 30, verse 5, every word of God proves true. Romans 8, 28 to 30, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. And 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Or Luke 12, 28 to 31. If God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. 
for all the nations of the world seek after these things and your father knows that you need them instead seek his kingdom and all these things will be added to you but beyond simple head knowledge we need to pray that god would open the eyes of our hearts as we read and as we familiarize ourselves with scripture that he would open our hearts to truly see the truth of his word to see it and know it both intellectually and emotionally since our hearts are treacherous we need something beyond ourselves something above and outside of ourselves in order for this truth to actually have any impact on our hearts we need to live by faith and not by sight and as i said earlier trust is not simply a stacking of facts on one side pro one thing and cons on the other hand we need god to move our hearts sometimes we can read the promises of god and they run off us like water off a duck's back we receive no comfort whatsoever from them so we need to pray for grace to see to know to apprehend the promises of god we need to know scripture the word the wisdom of god but in order for that knowledge to have any relevance or to gain any traction in our lives we need to know and be intimately connected with the word the lord jesus himself and that brings us to our third point it will be okay whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool but he who walks in wisdom will be delivered John 6 37 says all that the father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me I will never cast out have you come to Christ do you know him do you know the power of his resurrection have you confessed your sins and experienced forgiveness I'd say that this is essential on two counts firstly the promises given in scripture are not given to all and sundry they're given to the people of God now, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you have no right to claim the promises of God. You are not one of the people of God. You are of your father, the devil. And these promises that God has given us in his word will be of no value to you in, in life or in death. But secondly, in order to have confidence in the promises of God, you need to know that God himself is able to deal with whatever life throws at you all the problems and trials that you face in this world, you need to know and have confidence that God is able and willing to overcome these things. The only way that you can have such a confidence is to see how God has dealt with your biggest problem, namely sin. The way that Jesus came to earth, lived a perfect life, and gave his own life as a sacrifice which was ultimately accepted by the Father, the Father raising him from the dead, proving that Jesus had been victorious in his mission. If Jesus could conquer sin and death, the two biggest enemies, then there is nothing that this life can throw at you which he will not be able to help you through. Furthermore, you'll understand that it's not life that throws these problems at you, but you'll begin to have an understanding and a, a peace about the fact that it is your heavenly Father who providentially arranges all of life's circumstances for your good. Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. Now, trusting in God does not mean simply sticking your head in the ground and ignoring reality. Trusting God doesn't mean that you walk around denying reality with that glib phrase from Hollywood, it'll be okay. The truth is that in the coming days, you may actually lose your job. You may lose your business. You may lose your house, your car. You may not be able to send your kids to that school that they go to anymore. You might even lose loved ones or even your own life. By worldly standards and according to worldly wisdom, it might not be okay. Trusting in God is not about denying reality. Trusting in God means that you have a strong underlying confidence in God's control over affairs. It's a strong underlying confidence that God is able and willing to cause all things to work together for your good and for his glory. And this confidence arises out of a faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, which has already reconciled you to your heavenly father. Trusting God is knowing that it will all be okay because God is your father and he holds you in his hand and he knows what he is doing far better than you do. 
I'll be honest, in, in the past few weeks, I've really had to preach this sermon to myself. I've had moments of real de des despondency over this lockdown period. I consider myself a realist. Um, I, I'm often the one who's sitting in the corner, seeing all the problems when, when others are gung-ho about a particular thing. You might call me a pessimist, someone who sees the glass half empty, and, and maybe I am. But I don't have a bright hope that things are all going to go back to the way they were before. I think that things may be tough in the days and months and years ahead of us. I've had to preach this message to myself all week. But trusting in God does not mean denying all of that. Trusting in God is a confidence that even if I'm right, even if my worst fears are right, and we have far tougher days ahead of us than we have behind us, this will not mean desolation for me. We've, we just saw in, in the book of Mark how for the unbelieving apostate Jews, the destruction of the temple meant desolation. But for the Christians, it didn't. And so whatever trials and hardships I go through will not mean desolation for me. Trusting in God is knowing that one way or another, I will be delivered. Maybe it'll be a miraculous delivery. And there will be, there will be something like Elisha's servant's experience with God's um, miraculous providence supernaturally saving me from the situation. Maybe like the widow's oil, God will keep things going in a way that simply defies any explanation. I've certainly had that sort of deliverance in the past. Maybe it'll be miraculous, or maybe it'll be a completely different life from, from here on. Maybe it'll even be my own death. Either way, I will be delivered because Jesus is alive. God delivered Christ from the grave, and he delivered my own soul from my sin, and so he will deliver me from this present darkness. It will all be okay. We need to be convinced of this, brothers and sisters. We need to believe that God knows better than we do what we need. Sometimes my kids just want to eat cake and watch TV. In fact, you could say that all the time my kids just want to eat cake and watch TV. But my denying them their wish, not giving them cake all the time, not letting them continually watch TV is not me being unloving. In fact, it's, it's exactly the opposite. To them, it looks like they may be getting the, the hard end of the bargain. But I know that all the cake and TV in the world will not leave them happy and fulfilled. I know that sometime, sometimes veggies and flu injections and good old naps are what they really need to make them happy. So trusting in God is not trusting in God for the things that we think we need. If that's your idea of trusting in God, you're going to be disillusioned and disappointed. We are trusting that in spite of what we think we need, even if it looks like things are crumbling all around us, even then we will trust in God. We will not trust in our own minds like a fool. Rather, we're going to rest in the certainty of God's love for us knowing that it will all be okay. After Jesus' baptism, we read that the Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted for 40 days. Now, during this entire time, Jesus ate nothing. And Matthew tells us rather nonchalantly that after this time, Jesus was hungry. The devil tempted Jesus then to use his divine powers to provide himself with food in such a way that it wouldn't have been appropriate for one who was fully man and who ought to have been trusting in God, the Father, to provide for him. Now Jesus, instead of giving in to temptation and turning the, the stones into bread, which must have been a, a real temptation for him, uh, because he was feeling a natural hunger within him, he, rather than giving in to that temptation, responds, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. There he's quoting from Deuteronomy 8 verse 3, and so this is a, a, an ideal example of our Savior modeling what it is to trust God in spite of what looked like impossible circumstances. We see our Savior here intensely hungry and in real physical need of sustenance, refusing to disobey God. He was refusing to give way to sin. He was refusing to give way to anxiety or to panic. But rather he takes truth and he applies it concretely to his situation. 
But what could he possibly have meant? Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. How, how could that have helped? Let me ask you this. Ultimately, is it bread that keeps us alive? How was bread created? Was it not by the words from the mouth of God? In the same way, let me put it to you that is, is it really our job? Is it really our salary, our healthcare system, medication, the number of ventilators? Are these the things that are going to keep us alive? No. Just as man does not live by bread alone, so man does not live by rands and cents and medical intervention alone. Ultimately, we live in complete dependence on God himself down to our very next breath. And so my appeal is simply that in these days of trial, let's not get too focused on the means, the instruments that we are used to seeing God employ. God usually gives us sustenance and our daily bread by our jobs. He usually uses the healthcare system to keep us alive. And yet he's not bound to these things. They're just gifts. And we want to look beyond the means. We want to look ultimately to the God who gives the gifts, the God who provides for our needs and who is able to do so in an infinite number of ways. He's not limited to using the things that we're used to seeing. So let's take him at his word. Let's believe in his love for us. Let's trust him. Let's forsake trusting in our own hearts and minds. Let's forsake foolishness. Let's walk in wisdom, confident of God's ultimate deliverance. It will all be okay. Let's pray. Our Father, we do thank you that we can call you that. And we thank you that you are teaching us to trust you in these days of hardship. Lord, you know that our church is going through trials of different sorts. Some of us are facing uh, the threat of, of contracting the virus. Some of us are facing the real possibility of losing our jobs. Some of us don't know where our meals are going to be coming from. Lord, the future is uncertain, but we want to come tonight and ask that, Lord, we believe, help our unbelief. We pray that you would teach us not to trust in our hearts and minds and what we can see and touch and feel and hear, but that we would trust in your word, that we would know your word. Lord, give us the urgency that we need to invest time in knowing your word, not only the words of scripture, but also the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ. May we know your word, and I pray that you would help us to believe your word and that that would stir up real faith, real peace, a real trust of God in our own hearts, and Lord, that you would be glorified in our lives. We pray these things and pray for deliverance in Jesus' name. Amen.